Բարի երեկո սիրուրի պարեկամներ։ Այսօրվա մեր հյուրն է գլենդել կաղաքի զինվորարության մեծը կամ ոստգանության մեծը Chief Manuel Manny Set, right? That's the right name. I'm I'm trying to go for some more higher any talkman, but ade anuna. So mezi hamar bidi khosi glender kaaki berchin iratarsun merun masin, hat kabes bercheres as terkagan panerun masin. Ye bidi khosi tarabes mer kaaki glenderin bor shat abahov kaakteren megne. Pariye gazek. Welcome. In, in Armenian. Yeah, great Sid, to be here. It's really uh, our pleasure to have you on our show. Our show is a community-based uh, program. It's been around for five years. We talk basically about uh, issues related to the Armenian community, not necessarily Armenian um, uh, personalities on the show, but also non-Armenians as well. Sure. So you're welcome to our show. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. A little bit background. Usually we start with your background. You've been, <coughs> how long have you been in the city? What's your background? I was reading, great, you have a master's in public administration. And, and so just the audience is yours. Yeah, no, so uh, first generation Cuban American. Uh, my entire family was born in Cuba, uh, immigrated to this country. And I was fortunate enough to be raised here in Southern California, uh, grew up in the Long Beach and Downey area, uh, went to college, got my bachelor's degree, uh, was a student athlete, uh, and then eventually had the opportunity uh, to get hired by the Culver City Police Department in the early 2000s. Uh, spent about 20 years there, working my way up the ranks, uh, working a wide variety of assignments. Uh, during that time, I also went back to school, got my master's degree. Um, and then just uh, towards the end of 2022, the opportunity presented itself to potentially come back or come to the city of Glendale and serve as their police chief and uh, applied for the position, went through a very long, arduous process, uh, very competitive process, and um, was fortunate. And uh, started off uh, here in Glendale as their police chief earlier this year in 23, January of 23. I'm into my third month now. You're and, new on uh, the job. New on the job. Did you pass the rookie. probation period? Uh, I'm, still, <laughs> I'm still a rookie, uh, but it's been great. It's been great, and uh, I, I've been telling everyone that'll listen the welcome that I have received, not only from the staff at the police department, uh, but more impressively from the community, uh, has been nothing short of amazing. Very warm, very welcoming, uh, a lot of long days, very busy, uh, but a lot of it's been really in the community, spending time getting to know the community, getting to know its many cultures, uh, certainly the Armenian culture that's got a, a huge population, a big contingent in Glendale, and. Uh, off to a great start. I'm really enjoying it, really enjoying it. Chief, I lived in Glendale. I still continue living in Glendale, even though I can live anywhere in, in California, uh, the last 25 years. Sure. And I've always been um, thankful that I live in this city, in this great community. Mm -hmm. It's a fantastic community. Uh, what makes Glendale so unique? Because we're, we have a very safe environment. We do. I mean, hardly you can leave your doors closed. It's very safe. <coughs> Yeah, right. Well, I'll start by saying, before we talk about the police department, it's an amazing community. And I think it's the people that make up that community. Very diverse, as I touched on, certainly a big Armenian population, but there's also a great deal of Latinos and Hispanics. We've got a significant Korean population. It is very much what you would expect from my L.A. county city in that it's very diverse, very rich. And uh, I think I would start there with what makes it amazing. But, um, you know, you talk about safety. One of the reasons I wanted to come be a part of this organization is it has a great reputation, very professional, high level of service to the community, uh, and really safe. And as you know, city of Glendale has consistently for many years now been ranked uh, as one of the safest cities in America. Um, and I think that is a direct reflection certainly of its police department, but also the relationship and the partnership that that police department, our police department shares with so much of our community and the support that the police department receives from the community uh, and that partnership really allows for the department to go out, uh, fight crime and keep that community really safe. And, and you feel it when you, when you drive into Glendale, it feels different than the rest of Los Angeles. And uh, we pride ourselves in that. Uh, I think our community prides itself in that. And uh, I'm excited to be a part of that. What are some of the challenges the police department has? Do you have enough budget? I mean, the city council gives you enough budget to deal with. I know all of us have budgets, but mm -hmm. th does the police get enough budget, let's say? 
So, you know, we talk about support and that support for the department and for city staff really starts with our city council. Very, very fortunate to have a council, five elected members, a uh, city manager uh, that are incredibly supportive of police, fire, public safety. I think they all understand the importance, the foundation that that is for any community. Uh, budgets are challenging mm -hmm. and they're, you know, uh, we all wish we had endless buckets of money. That's not Nobody reality. Has. Nobody does, <laughs> right? Uh, but I think they do a really good job, um, in my estimation, of balancing that, making sure that we're uh, budgeting and, 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 and funding our police department in a way that allows us to reasonably go out and do our job, uh, take care of the staff that work there. Um, but, you know, when we talk about challenges, um, while Glendale is fortunate to have very low crime rates, um, it doesn't mean we're without crime. Right, that says that's not realistic. We're not immune to it. So, uh, you know, there's challenges. We're seeing rises in crime across this country, across the region. And while ours in Glendale still stays relatively low, it is something to be mindful of. That we're constantly battling that. Uh, traffic safety. Um, you know, preaching to the choir, you've been in Glendale. Uh, like most of Los Angeles, a great deal of traffic, very congested. Uh, and both for the city council, for me as a police chief, for us as a police department, traffic safety will continue, has been, and will continue to be a Number priority. One issue. Uh, you know, <clears throat> it's up there. I would say it's top three for sure. Um, traffic safety. We want to we want to make sure that both our vehicles certainly are traveling safety, but pedestrian and bicycle safety are important. We want people to be able to feel like they can walk around downtown in the communities and not be uh, overly concerned by getting hit or or being able to do so in a safe manner. So. Uh, really working, you know, creating that as a focus. And then the other thing I would mention is recruitment, recruitment and retention. And particularly coming out of COVID, I think uh, so many professions are being impacted by challenges with bringing people back to the workforce. Um, and law enforcement's a challenging hmm. profession. Did you raise the salaries of officers to, I mean, because, I mean, it's hard to find employees nowadays. It I is. Mean, I have a hard time in my business because salaries went up so much after COVID. Right, and again, dealing with economic issues and budgeting. Uh, but I know coming out of 2022, um, the labor groups that represent the police department, the police management negotiated with the city and they all saw uh, pay increases, which is important. You know, we wanna make sure that as a police department, as a city staff, that we remain uh, competitive when it comes to our pay. That's a big part of making us an, an attractive uh, organization. Uh, but we also want to make sure that we have a good culture of an organization, a good environment uh, where staff can come and work, they feel supported, mm -hmm. feel developed, uh, that they have the resources they need to go out and do a good job. Now, what would an officer take a job, let's say, with uh, Glendale City as opposed to Pasadena or Burbank, let's say? I'm just trying to understand the dynamics. Yeah. So, and I'm a perfect example of that. Um, Glendale or, Police... Or Culver City. Culver City, <laughs> right. Uh, all good organizations, all that have something to offer. But I, I would argue, and I believe, uh, and it was one of the reasons that I wanted to come here, Glendale has for some time been and, and is one of the premier law enforcement organizations uh, in the region. I would argue even in the nation. We talk about the safety right. that it provides. Right. Um, it's a good mid-sized city. Um, I think it's the perfect mix in that as a young officer, you might look at the city of Los Angeles, a really big organization, a lot of opportunities to do different things that might attract you, but maybe it lacks a little bit of that family atmosphere, knowing the people you work around. Some of the agencies you mentioned before, much smaller organizations, more of a family atmosphere, but maybe not quite the opportunities. I think Glendale is like the perfect mix and balance of both. It's the third largest municipal agency in LA County. So it's a good size, it's a good amount of opportunity and, and opportunity for growth and development. But we have a very tight-knit organization, a family-type uh, atmosphere. Uh, and then again, a community that is incredibly supportive of it. Um, you look around the region and the county, not everybody, uh, not all the police organizations experience maybe the support that Glendale PD uh, receives from, from community, our community. Yeah. Uh, so that's a, that's a big deal. That's a big deal to go out and do a really challenging job. If you can have that community support, that goes such a long way. What is... Uh since this is an Armenian American show, mm -hmm. how many, if you know the number, uh, how many Armenian Americans serve on the police force? So I'll start by saying that um, the the diversity overall of our organization, Glendale PD, has grown immensely over the years. A um, little bit of backstory: my uncle, a uh, Cuban American, 
uh, was a police officer in Glendale in the 80s. And at the time, I believe, was maybe the second Latino Hispanic uh, police officer at the time, and virtually no Armenians in the yeah, police department, I mean, none. Probably. Where you come till today, um, my management team alone, command staff, management level ranks, um, I have three or four right off the top of my head that I can think about. Um, so the amount of uh, Armenians that we have seen within the organization has grown exponentially. Um, I think now it's starting to account for, I think, upwards of 10% of our organization on the sworn side. And then that's just the sworn side, then you talk about the professional side. So uh, it's grown immensely. Uh, mm -hmm. both in the management ranks. We see them promoting up the ranks now. Uh, one of my police captains is an Armenian-American. Um, so, and that's important. Yeah. It's important that as a police department, we reflect the community that we serve. And we want uh, all our community, and certainly our Armenian community in Glendale, to see um, themselves reflected in our organization. Mm -hmm. And we want to also be able to recruit new from young police officers yeah. from that community. And we need them to be able to see some of themselves in the organization. So um, it, it's growing. It's come a long way, and we're going to continue to try to grow it in its diversity. Chief, do you deal with homelessness? As I drive to the studio from Glendale, from right. my home in Glendale, Glendale, I drive the streets, and, and today, just as an example, it's clean streets, no homelessness. I don't see anybody. I come to L.A., and I'm not trying to put L.A. down, uh, because I grew up in LA uh, in the uh, in the 80s, I went to high school here. I I see a lot of tents on the streets, which is disgusting. It should it should not happen in this country. I mean, that's another topic. But you know, Glendale, how do you keep it so safe? So, I mean, what do you do? Take these homeless people, ship, shove no, them somewhere no, no, else? No, 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 we I don't mean, do that. I don't see it in Glendale, yeah. which is a good thing. It's a great but thing. What do you do in order to get to that point? Right, yeah, well, we're not grabbing them and driving them anywhere else. I think that the, the city, city staff, because it's a collaborative effort, but the police department, um, in, in, in the most uh, simplest way I can put it, we show it a great deal of attention. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is we go out there, we have uh, a HOPE team, is what we call it, our help, homeless outreach uh, team. We have mental health clinicians from the Department of Mental Health working alongside our police officers, um, working right out of uh, our, our police building that go out every day and contact these individuals. And we build relationships with them, we build rapport with them, we offer them services, we take a services first approach to trying to help them get housing, substance abuse um, resources, mm -hmm. uh, mental health resources. Uh, but either way, we show it a great deal of attention. Uh, I think the type of, I think we throw the type of resources and attention at it that maybe a much bigger city like the city of Los Angeles maybe can't do to that same degree. Um, so we go out there, we offer them services, we take a services first approach, we try to find uh, pathways to get them off our streets, get them the help they need, but we also um, ensure that they're following the rules and that they're not breaking laws and that they're not unreasonably impacting the quality of life in Glendale. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why you see, as soon as you cross that, that Glendale city limit, you see a, a different feel, very cleanly. Um, not to say that we're without homeless, but the number's very, very low. And we're continually reaching out, contacting these folks, working with them, uh, again, to try to get them off the streets. Yeah, I mean, I don't see it on the streets, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. And I always wonder, I mean, how do they do this? I mean, why can't we pass this system to city of LA, let city of LA do the same thing, right. and we can get rid of the homelessness issue. Even Karen Bath, as the new mayor, said she's going to take care of it in the next hundred days. I think she said, but I haven't seen it yet. I mean, yeah, I come to ask. LA quite quite often. And again, and I don't, uh, I don't want to sound like I'm repeating myself, but I, I can't understate it enough. Is also having the support of our community and our elected officials in Glendale, uh, again, to support us in going out and doing this work. Not only in the work that we're doing but providing us the resources uh, to go out there and deal with some of these challenges. Sure. We're going to take a very short break, and when we come back, we'll talk about some of the recent events regarding the Armenian community and this size popping up in the city, which making everybody so nervous in our community. Of course. Sireyi Paygamler, Gaç Tatarma Bidarnek, Yebidi Berar Tanakmer, Haydakrin, Aysurva, Polis Şifinet.
Tirer paygamlar Ayşoba Mer Hürne Glende City polis şifa yerme kurahenk var Ayşor meziyet ke xosi Glendel kagaki harcırum masin. Chief uh, the issue that concerns Armenians and there's obviously some historical sensitivities. We all grew up including myself about the Armenian genocide and it's a really touchy issue even 100 years later yeah. with the Armenians. Anytime you bring the genocide or the killing people gets very nervous you know including my grandmothers and because she was driven out of uh, Turkey or our ancient Armenia to Lebanon that's how we end up in Lebanon from Lebanon we came to this country 45 years ago. However, that historical issue is very sensitive with Armenians. And all of a sudden, this, you know, whoever did it, I guess, um, wanted some hate and really to hurt the Armenians and, and saying the genocide is going to continue, this and that. It is very, very important to us to know, I, I guess maybe there's not cameras that sees who put it there, uh, to create this hate in our community. And I'm really concerned about it. What is the police is doing about it? Is there any efforts besides the press release? I mean, what efforts has been taken uh, to stop that? If there is, or even not to stop, at least bring these people to justice. To justice. Whoever did this thing, it is, it is really, really to me and to the Armenians. And, and we have, what, half a million Armenians in the city of L.A., in, in the county mm -hmm. of L.A. Uh, it's a big issue. Understood, and, and as it should be uh, a big issue. And I want to start by saying that, you know, uh, both myself as a police chief uh, and Glendale Police Department as an organization, I know I speak for our elected officials, um, we will stand against and we will take very seriously uh, any acts of hate in our community. It's not acceptable. It's not wanted in our community. It won't be acceptable. And to that end, from a police department standpoint, uh, we will bring all our resources to bear uh, to investigate any of those sorts of incidents. Um, that will include trying to identify who is responsible for them, if there's some criminal uh, action that can be taken from a prosecution uh, standpoint, uh, arrests to be made, if it, if it qualifies mm -hmm. as a hate crime, and there's some nuance with when it qualifies as a hate crime versus hate speech or hate incident. Right. Uh, but either way, I think it's important for our entire community to know, and in this case, our Armenian community to know, um, that either way, um, we take those things incredibly serious. We're going to uh, do a threat assessment on each one of them to ensure that there's no credible violence associated to them. Uh, as I said, we're going to investigate them fully. If there's some criminal action and follow-up to be done, uh, it will be done. And then I think the other piece that's really important is all our community, our Armenian community, needs to know that their police department stands with them and that we support them. We and that, that. We're going to work Thank through. You. Yeah, of course. And, um, you know, that we're going to collaboratively with our community uh, work through these and then move forward from them the best way we can to reassure our community that these things won't be accepted, that it is safe for everyone in our community, certainly our Armenian community members, to be here in Glendale and uh, that their department's here to support them. Because the Armenians uh, are uh, family-oriented people. They're very conservative uh, and they support the police, yes, law enforcement. and. I know there's some bad apples among Armenians too that do things which bothers me. And I have this, uh, every time I see any crime, I say, oh, let's hope he's not an Armenian. Sure. <laughs> the little thing in me always tells yeah. me from my childhood days, because we always think, you know, we cannot do wrong. I mean, at least in, in my mind when I was growing up, because of the genocide, it's just like in our mind, yeah. thrown out of your country. I mean, losing all your properties, your assets. Terrible. That's how my grandparents did. I mean, they were shipped out uh, out of Turkey and, and their lands and their properties were all gone. They ended up in Lebanon with, without knowing a word of Arabic. Yeah. I mean, imagine, with thousands of other people. So to us, it's a very touchy issue. I'm, I'm bringing this issue in order to point out how whenever you see any Turkish, you know, we're going to take care of you, we're going to kill you, whatever, it makes us very nervous as a community, it scares us and makes us very uncomfortable. But I'm so glad that the police is doing uh, its best trying to find and bring them to justice. And I think sometimes as a law enforcement profession, we look at some of these incidents, hate incident, and sometimes it doesn't reach the level of being a hate crime. And I think in some instances, some 
sometimes uh, segments of our profession have maybe been quick to kind of dismiss that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think as a police department, again, we need to uh, be responsive to our community. We need to under understand our community and some right. of their <coughs> histories and the context of those things and how it's affecting them. And we got to be responsive to that. And um, again, we have to fully investigate these things. Uh, and we also need to be compassionate in understanding uh, that it's also our job to support our community and, sure. and working through and helping to do what we can to alleviate some of those fears or concerns that they might have, for sure. I mean, our community, the Armenian American community, is very supportive of law enforcement. And uh, yeah. all the years that I lived here, the last 25 years, since I bought my house, I got married, I moved to Glendale from uh, Encino. Uh, I love the city. I mean, that was not my first choice, but it ended up, because my wife wanted uh, this particular house, and I ended up loving the city, and, and I enjoy it. I know a lot of friends in the community, both in Armenian, non-Armenian, uh, and uh, I want to make sure the city is safe. I want to make sure there's no crime, and there's no hateness against uh, the populations, especially our own. I mean, we have churches here, we have schools. I mean, uh, my daughter goes to school. Uh, so it is very important to us to feel safe that you're not going to have some Turk or whoever it is, I don't know, comes in and does something really bad uh, to, to, our, to our community. And that's what our big concern is. Of course. Um, one question, always I see in it, and I'm always curious, because uh, being running a business, I always look at the dollars and, and the budget. And, and uh, I see when they, they stopped a car, Another police comes, and sometimes three comes. I was wondering, is that that waste? I mean, you already have one uh, police car with two officers. All of a sudden, another car comes in with two other officers. Whoa, I say, that's, uh, you know, isn't that misallocation of uh, resources? Resources, sure. And I'm just curious. I, again, maybe there's a valid reason behind it, but I just want to point out, because I see it all the time. Sure. Yeah, I assure you there is. And um, a lot of it's going to roll around safety. And in Glendale, most of our police cars out on the street is usually going to be one officer. There's exceptions. Sometimes right. it's a newer officer on training, something of that nature. But it's usually one, one officer. And sometimes that traffic stop or that investigation might involve a couple of people in that car. And from a safety standpoint, we always want to have more officers than whoever we're dealing with. Uh, the presence of more officers helps de-escalate any issues. If, God forbid, there's some need to use some level of force or intervention, do we have those folks backup, there? Yeah, backup, backup, for I lack see. of better words. But uh, it is something we're mindful of, too, because sometimes people don't understand that. And they see, hey, one car, and there's three police cars. Some come three cars. I say, whoa, it must be really bad. There might That's be right. some follow-up uh, work that needs to be done, some safety uh, challenges, particularly if we're doing a field investigation and we're going to start getting people out of the car. We want to have a couple of officers there so that... One or two officers can be with the, with the subjects that are being detained. Maybe someone else is searching a vehicle. Someone might be meeting, another officer might be meeting with a victim of a crime. Things of that nature. Um, but I, I get that question okay, a lot. Okay, yeah. I get that Two question. other points. Uh, and it was curiosity on my part. If the officer stopped a car, does the officer have the right to search the car or has to get approval from somebody else to search the car? Uh, I mean, it's, it may, could be a legal question. I don't know. I'm not a lawyer. It's a legal question. Uh, so it do, doesn't, our officers do not need to get approval from a supervisor it, yeah. or anything like to search a car, but they have to have good legal reason. Um, they're going to have to oftentimes have some kind of reasonable suspicion or probable cause to be able to go in and search a vehicle. Um, for instance, we stop a driver. Driver's unlicensed. Um, we place him or her under arrest because they're unlicensed driving without a vehicle. Uh, and we're going to tow that vehicle before we will tow that no vehicle. License. If there's no license, just as an example, before we tow that vehicle, we have the legal right to search the vehicle. Um, if an individual that we contact maybe is on parole and has subject to search conditions, officer has the, the legal has the right, right to, to search the vehicle. So there's some different um, uh, instances when the Fourth Amendment and the Constitution will allow for our officers to search a vehicle as a part of their investigation. They have to make sure that they are in those legal confines to be doing the job correctly. So if you have a driver license, a valid driver license, mm -hmm. that stopped that issue because here you have a driver license, license, so they have no right to 
come Correct. and search the car because you, you you cannot tow the car away. Correct. Or, or impound the car. Again, if if there's some other reason, maybe we stop your, your driver's license valid, but maybe you have a warrant for your arrest. That's another issue. That's another. Now you've been arrested. Again, we then subsequently before we tow that vehicle, we could search search your car. What about your car registration expired? You could be stopped for that. That's against, you know, it's a violation. Can um, you take the car, impound the car, or no? You just say, hey, it has go to, register your car. It depends on how long, how long overdue. A few days, a month, no, it's a citation. citation. Once you start going like three months, six months overdue, there does hit a point where not only is a citation, we can actually tow your vehicle. Okay, okay, yeah, I see. Okay. I see. It's good to know these yeah, points. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. If the officer stops you, and suspicious, you're drunk. So what do you do? If, if you're drunk, what do you do? You just say, hey, I'm drunk, the officer arrest me, or you say, I'm sorry. I mean, what do you do? I am always going to say that, you know, what, what we always ask of our entire community. But again, that depends also if you had a glass of wine, just a glass of wine with food for dinner, let's say, or an event you went. Sure. So what do you do? I'm always gonna ask that our community be cooperative and respectful with the officers. Number one, to make sure that nothing escalates and everything stays safe. Right. Be honest with the officers. Um, mm -hmm. It's not against the law to have a glass of wine with dinner. Um, but then you also need to know your own personal limits. Yeah. Mike, you might be able to sit down and have three glasses of wine and be I fine. I don't drink, actually. I, 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 I used to drink. I have, have one, anymore. and maybe I shouldn't be driving, yeah. right? So um, the legal limit is, is, is it has to be below 0 .08 of your blood alcohol. Um, you know, percentage or, or limit, or, or if you will. So um, if the officer suspects uh, that you might be under the influence, he might ask you out of the car and then put you through some field sobriety test, test yeah. to try to determine are you in fact impaired. That's really what driving under the influence is all about is the officer is trying to understand are you impaired and are you in a in a state that isn't safe for you to the drive. The officer the walks, you cannot walk. Walk you, and you're falling you, over. Boy, boy, you're in you, you shouldn't be driving a car. <laughs> and uh, that could you know, course, results yeah. in an arrest. Okay, I, this is about mm, maybe long, what, over 10 years ago that I remember. I was coming home, right on my, just below my street, the officer stopped me. And he said to me, it was late, it was like two o'clock in the morning. He says, why are you waving? You're going like this. I told him, officer, I'm not drunk, but I was fixing something where the car went this way, that way. I uh, said to me, give me your driver's license and registration. I thought, gee, what, what's going to happen? I mean, I didn't know. So I gave him my driver's license, registration, and he checked something, and I waited, waited. I said, well, what, how long? I, I waited a long time. I was thinking something bad is going to happen. This took a long time. He came back. He says, you know, be safe. You know, your house is there. I see it on your, uh, you know, driver's license. So he let me go. But in, in your mind, when office stops, you know, you always immediately think the worst, right? I think the worst. I mean, what did I do? <laughs> I've been a police officer for 20 years. And if I'm driving home from work and a police officer pulls up next to me, I get nervous. Right? <laughs> That's I mean, I, and I'm human very honest. I told him, I said, I'm not drunk. I mean, it's human you drinking? Nature. He asked me a question. Were you drinking? I said, no. But someone told me, and again, uh, this is a free show. We were, someone told me, I think it was, I don't know, it was a lawyer or somebody told me, even you had a glass of wine, let's say, for dinner, deny it. I said, how could I lie? I said, I said deny it because they're going to go put you through zinger because they're going to think you had more than one. You're lying. I would never suggest a lie. If you haven't done anything wrong, there's nothing to lie about. To lie. And, um, you know, the other thing I would put out there is obviously the officers are out there doing the work, right? And they're trying to identify someone possibly driving under the influence. Right. That's incredibly dangerous, both for the driver and if you hit somebody else, you hit a pedestrian, right. you hit another driver. Sometimes, too, you know, you get stopped, you know what you're doing, you're going right. home. That officer might be responding to that area of a burglary that just occurred. And the description of the vehicle that was last seen leaving the house that was burglarized matches the description of yours. <laughs> and he's going to stop you and, and maybe do some field investigation to ascertain. That, you know, Can you, it. let's say if you're driving, you're the chief, and you see somebody either, you know, doing something wrong, mm -hmm. would you stop 
that vehicle or you will call the other police, hey, I'm the chief, I'm not the one going to go uh, stop this guy. So would you call uh, another I, officer I, sure, or another yeah. car? I think it would depend. I'm always curious yeah, what the yeah. chief does. Yeah, Could I? Yes, could I, I could. I, yes. I have just as much legal authority and, and uh, police powers as they do. It would probably really depend on the, the severity. If this was something serious, somebody was getting hurt, 100%, I would take action, call for backup, but I would take you action. You would take it back up. If it's see. something more minor, um, you know, nobody needs the chief in the way. Uh, yeah. I'd call an officer and let them deal with it. Well, maybe I should say, I know the chief, I know the mayor, <laughs> they're both my friends. <laughs> Get me off the hook. Get you off the hook. I think you're going to be okay. Uh, no, I'm, uh, yeah, we're all kidding aside. Uh, what is your message to our community? And I know you talk about our community, about Glendale. You know, we both love Glendale. Uh, I've lived here 25 years. I want the city to be safe. And thanks to you, thanks to your department, this city is safe. And I don't live anywhere else, even though I have two other houses in two other cities. But I always prefer Glendale because I know all my neighbors. Yeah. And sometimes I watch my neighbors to make sure uh, if everything is good. And yeah, I've always been very thankful that I live in the city. And I feel safe. I really do. I, you know, I have an 87 year old mother. I have a new wife and 13-year-old daughter. So I want to make sure. I'm speaking for the entire population of Glendale, 200,000 or 205,000 population we have. They all want to be safe. We all live here. We don't want to be shot. We don't want to burglarize. I mean, we want to be very safe in our city. And thanks to you, we were very safe. Thanks to your department, I should say. Yeah. Um, I would say, you know, first I would say thank you. And um, uh, I think we have a police department that does an amazing job, um, but a part of the reason that they're able to do that job is the great deal of support that we feel from the community. That really goes a long way. It cannot be understated. Uh, and then the other piece I'd like them to know is that, that we're here to support them. And um, if you're in a position that you got to call the police department, let's say in the city of Los Angeles, might they may be, not show up. Uh, they may not, oh. or it might take a half hour half or hour. an hour or something like that. Um, one of the great things about living in the city of Glendale is if you need the police and you pick up and you call us, we're going to be there within a couple of minutes. Yeah. Um, our response time is, uh, is, is really incredible world class. Fast. It's incredible. Yeah, yeah. And when crime does occur, as little as it does, when it does occur, we do an amazing job of solving it. And we, we have a great deal of resources, a full service organization, and um, we're here to support them. And we're here to provide those resources, provide a high level of service, and to do it in a professional manner. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, it's my job to not only make sure that we continue to provide a high level of service, but that we do it in a way that's reflective of this community in a professional manner and in a way that we all can be proud of. And, you know, we've unfortunately seen some incidents uh, and instances across this country where you see police being less than professional. Um, you know, I. I and the men and women of the, the department come to work every day to make sure not only that we provide oh, a high level of service. Somebody you're trying to arrest and beat. Yeah, it, uh, that's we want to be professionals. Yeah. And sometimes part of police work is, is there's got to be forced. It's got to be used. Sometimes people that don't want to go with the program or mm -hmm. want to be violent, and we have to meet that. Um, but there's a way of doing that and a way of doing it like a professional. And uh, our men and women, our organization prides itself in a high level of professionalism in everything we're doing, even when we have to put our hands on somebody to take them into custody. So we pride ourselves in that. It's something that I feel strongly about. And uh, I know our staff does. We have really talented people that work at the police department. Uh, we provide them a great deal of training to make sure, again, that we can go out, provide that high level of service, and to do it like professionals. If you would ask the city council, if you have a request, how's their reaction? If you ask, like, say, more dollars. I mean, usually money is a big issue. Sure. Let's say you say, hey, I need 10% more in my budget. What does the city council will say? I can always use more, right? 25% of the money. We, 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 always, we always we need can. more money. Who can. doesn't need more money? I think as the police chief, in collaboration with the city manager and the city, uh, city council, we have to find the balance. And I will tell you that if I go to my city manager and to our city council. Is your city manager your boss? Is city manager is my well, boss. It's not the mayor, it's the city manager. City manager. Okay. However, as a police chief, while I was appointed by the city manager, the city council had to approve that appointment. Right. Um, so city manager is my boss, but naturally the, the council in some oh. ways is my boss too. And um, we, as a department head, as a police chief, I naturally work closely with all of that group. And um, 
Do you make regular reports to city council? Yeah, I was just at council week before last and I gave an update on our crime numbers from 2022. And uh, I'm at every single city council meeting. Um, there's times when there's items that come from the police department, I'll be there for that. And then even when there isn't items specifically on the agenda from the police department, I'm present in case some questions come mm -hmm. up, something that might cross over into policing. But to answer your question from before, you know, we have a, a city council and a city manager that understand the value of public safety. And if I bring them a request, um, it's strongly considered, usually from a place of finding a way to get me what I need. It's not always a yes, that's not reality. But more times than not, we're going to get the resources we need. We're a very well-equipped department, uh, well-funded one. And uh, I don't have any doubts that that's going to remain that way. Do you need way. more officers? We can always use more. Um, is you know, recruitment a challenge? In this it is. Recruitment's an incredible challenge. And uh, as I was saying earlier, it's, um, this is a profession that maybe a lot of people have shied away from over the last few years. You see, again, different parts of our, our nation, different parts of our region don't experience the support that we do in Glendale. I think that has caused some staff to shy away from the profession. It's a dangerous profession. Right. Uh, a lot of scrutiny around the profession. But it's a great profession, and you know we're we're seeing a great deal of competition amongst organizations recruiting mm. new staff, throwing money at it, advertising themselves. So it's important that we stay competitive, and I think we are. Uh, again, I would argue that we're one of the premier organizations, one of the best. Um, uh, you know, right now I think we, we've got some openings, some vacancies on funded positions. You don't positions. have high vacancy rates. No, I think we're at about six or seven percent. I'd like, I'd yeah. like to drive that down under five. Right. Um, you know, we're always going to have a few. That's the nature right. of running an organization. How about retirement? What's the age? I mean, is it a mandatory retirement at 65 you have to retire? No mandatory retirement, depending on your retirement formula, which varies. could be anywhere from 50, as early as 50 to as late as 57. Um, you'll sometimes see some staff that when goes into the 60s. When you're 60 years old, you already should retire. You can keep working, but you probably should. I mean, at working that point, a desk, maybe, that's job, maybe, yeah. as opposed to going to the streets. It's a demanding job, right? Physically demanding yeah. job to be out in a patrol car responding to calls. Um, there's certainly some folks that are in their 50s and 60s and can still do it still great, do it. Um, but probably more tailored for some younger folks. So. Usually uh, for us in our profession, you know, that's another thing, 30, 35 years in this profession. It's hard. That's a long time. A long Usually time. once you get to that age, you've earned your retirement and you're right, ready to right. move on. Once you retire, do you get uh, full benefits at yeah. post-retirement? Depending how many years you put in right. uh, to service will dictate how much, you know, what your pension looks like. Yeah. Um, and then you'll get a... You know, a retirement, retirement package. Yeah, package. Let's say you work 30 years. Oh, yeah, then you're going to get you're going to get a full retirement, full retirement package. Packages. Yeah. Uh, I think we covered a lot of issues uh, about the police and the community. What are your uh, aspirations for the city and the police department? Gosh, there's, there's so many. So I'll start with first and foremost, my job as a police chief, ensure public safety. Right. And when I think about public safety, we talk about keeping crime down, fighting crime traffic safety like we talked about and then emergency preparedness I think that's really important I think sometimes we talk about the crime we talk about the traffic the emergency preparedness our police officers much like our fire department um, they're our first responders and if there was to be some critical incident uh, a natural disaster things of that nature we want to make sure that as a department we're very well equipped very well trained very well prepared and we have plans in place how we respond to that to save lives and save property things of that nature. Um, recruitment and retention is a goal of mine. I think that's really important. We've got to recruit staff and we've got to do a good job of retaining them. Uh, and then the last thing I would say is, you know, I also, I want to do, make sure that we're doing a good job of where we are today as a department, high level of service, fighting crime, but also I think it's important that we think about the future and where we're going in five years, where we're going in 10 years, mm -hmm. the expectations of law enforcement, the challenges that are out there for us. Uh, and making sure that we find ways that we're staying out ahead of that and how we meet it, whether it's, um, again, through the recruitment, technology, you know, how do we merge that with what we do, use, using technology to fight crime and provide a high level of service. Um, the Olympics will be here in the L.A. area in 2028. We'll see what kind of impact that has in Glendale. Um, remains to be seen, but we want to be prepared for it. So just thinking about the future and then succession planning, you know. Um, right. 
I'm not going anywhere anytime young soon. Guy. I'm young. Uh, but, you know, uh, a handful of years from now when it's my time to move on, I want to make sure, pass it the baton, and I want to pass it to somebody from within the organization. Well, Chief, this is very uh, productive, informative, and I learned a lot. Uh, I'm sure our audience learned a lot. Uh, hopefully they understand English. Uh, yeah. Most of them do, but it's, uh, we have a lot of elderly Armenians uh, sure. listening to the show. We appreciate uh, all the explanation, and we do support you. We wish you well. We wish you personally health and well-being, and we wish the department a, a good success. And uh, we want to make sure city of Glendale stays safe and home for majority of us. Thank absolutely. you. Thank you for Thank your you show. Thank you for having me. Sure. Oh, absolutely. I saw about Mayor Haydakir Gberchana. Make sure I got link. You know, Chief Sidin or. I saw Nergea Gavi, Pasadvets Mezi, Haiha Mankin, Gapunetso Hartser, Police Department Tiet, Yev, Merchatsir, Glendale, Kahaki Yet. Shragalem, Kisher Pari.